Hello and welcome to Real Hi-Fi Help. Let's have a look at EPOS ES14. Yep, I got one of these bad boys back in the day. Um, I think we're talking about year 2007, 2008. Yeah, some, something like that. I got a used set of speakers and they were probably like, I don't know. 10 15 years old i can't remember but um i didn't pay a lot back then i think i only paid like five four five hundred bucks for them back then used i think that was a pretty good deal um the ones that i got were a bit uglier than these uh these were a bit more pretty with the epos logo the one that i had i don't know what happened but it got painted over, um, so it didn't have the original paint, so uh, it made it actually quite ugly, uh, the speaker. Whereas the original color, yeah, a bit more pretty, but still, ugh, <laughs> not really that um, pretty. doesn't have a huge uh, waff, wife acceptance factor. You can see them here, uh, pretty darn ugly, and you can see them there. And these spikes that they had on them, they could really like dig deep into the floorboards. I remember that um, with those stands that they had. Um, but interesting, interesting. This was where I, this is one of my first speakers where I really got into um, good intimate music, you know, uh, where I started to listen to some uh, I don't know, Dolly Parton, stuff like that, Emily Harris. I, I found that this speaker was actually pretty good at that. Um, intimate, country-like recordings, um, acoustic instruments, stuff like that, small concerts. Music where you didn't have a lot of traffic um, in smallish rooms. So I probably had something like a 10 to 15, 10 to 20 square meter room. Yeah, I think back then when I had these, I only had like 14 square meter room. But it was interesting, very interesting. Um, so treble, a bit edgy, metallic, raw, airy. Needed a bit more depth and ability to play loud, um, just like the mid-range. But <clears throat> I could hear that there wasn't a lot in the signal path. Um, I think I've read before that they had uh, like a special uh, short-ish short -ish signal. Um, and I could hear that. I could definitely hear that. Normally when you listen to a speaker, there is a lot of liabilities that you're listening to. You're listening to trashy cables, terminals, uh, crossover that typically um, just has a lot of filtering in it with some subpar um components you can hear that you know i've owned a lot of speakers you 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 can hear that at many times those things are in the way of the music and i felt that with this speaker this was the first speaker where i felt that there was a lot less between me and the music so it felt like it was a lot more of a direct uh, signal and that's why i like these uh, speakers at least back then uh, I had this on some Nate and some Audio Lab, Audio Labs. I can't remember what it was called, but um, it actually was a pretty decent um, starter sound. Uh, you couldn't really play loud. Um, it didn't really have a lot of layering, a lot of uh, extra bass and stuff like that, but. In a way, it was more of a simplistic, minimalistic sound. And I remember that it kind of favored music that was a bit more stylish, a bit more posh, um, a bit like a Verity speaker, uh, but just not nearly that uh, class of speaker, you know? So it, it, it was nice. It felt like you had a bit of, you know, authenticness um a bit of history you know a bit like going back in time and getting i don't know 
a vintage speaker. You know, it 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 just felt like from from a different time. So I I I kind of like that thinking back on it. Um, and yeah, a lot of speakers in this class price class back then had a lot of mold. You know, a lot of mm, holes in the sound. Uh, this kind of fake warm numb type of sound where they don't want to give you too much brightness so they create this sort of superficial lower level warmth and i didn't feel that they had too much of this you know so that was that was good you know that that that, that was like i could feel that i was getting into hi-fi i got some good uh value stuff you know and and you know it's just you know listening to acoustic music and that's basically why you get these classical music acoustic mus- music uh, jazz a bit of blues perhaps once in a while a bit of rock and pop but didn't really uh, do too much good there it was a bit on the weak side there but you know uh, you you could listen to some 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 interesting different types of of genres with this type of thing you know and yeah, I have to say it, but they, they, they weren't that good that they could cover all styles of music and uh, be used on all types of gear in all types of rooms. You you have to be pretty specific with these speakers. But yeah, interesting. Very, very interesting. And I just want to say that um, bass, yeah, uh, a bit limited, a bit rubbery, the uh, the response. I could actually hear the units themselves you, you can t- you could touch them i remember the feeling of the units they're very rubbery uh both in looks feel physically and sound so a bit weird um first time i had a speaker where the bass was rubbery so it gives it a different tonal character because of that and because you got a rubbery bass that doesn't quite go down in, in, in you know proper gears proper layer uh, layers and then you have this metal dome which sounded a bit metallic but you could keep that metallic sound a bit at bay i did that with fenden hull cables yeah not the best solution but mostly solved the problem i remember i had a low level audio note rca cable with this it, it it made it a bit better than the fenden hull cable but still eh, you know <laughs> um and um i remember a guy one of my friends back then who actually died some years ago but he had the same speaker and he had it on a classy not classy classic 6.6 amplifier which was an okay amplifier probably their their best amplifier back then it sounded better than at at, at my place because it was just a lot more powerful uh, but yeah that that gear had had its own problems but um that was interesting having a friend who also had the same pair of speakers um he was a temporary fan friend i knew for about 3 years time and um, that was just very interesting. Um, but but yeah, I, I could hear with this speaker being a book standing speaker that just generally I don't like book standing speakers because they feel very rolled off and, and focused at a certain level. So you have to keep them just relatively close to the walls in order to, to get a proper boosted bass, a proper boosted mid-range and treble, but if you get them too close, they sound closed in, you want to kind of pull them back out again, and then, you know, when you pull them back out, they go nuts, you know, and they get typically too bright, too overactive, and, yeah, um, I feel that we've evolved quite a bit. When you look at the newest models where we have two or three units, of book standing speakers where we have two in the front and like one bass unit at the back i feel that those newer book standing speakers are just generally a lot better than what we got from the 80s and uh, especially the the 90s um so yeah it's, it's a bit difficult for me to recommend these unless they're really really cheap but 
I, I, I like them. They, they, they were kind of. Um, I felt like I was in contact with the the artist, you know, the the singer. Um, that it was just a bit more raw and down to earth than normal speakers. Where with a lot of speakers from around the eighties and especially the nineties, um, I felt that a lot of those speakers just had so much hi-fi, um, and I mean that in a bad way, where everything just sounded like a sound effect mixed together with stuff that was moldy, with just a lot of frequencies that didn't make a lot of sense, didn't really come together. Um, and I felt that with at least something like this, I could listen to, again, uh, stuff like Dolly Parton, Emily Harris, Linda Ronstadt. That's music I would never have listened to before when I owned uh, the normal lower models of B&W from the 90s. Um, because that just got too awkward, too weird, where with this speaker, it felt like there was a, a sort of layer that was peeled off, so you got just more in contact with the artist and yeah it wasn't that pretty it was a bit raw it was a bit on the unfiltered not always good side but you know i could also listen to you know stuff that just generally was a bit more intimate and beautiful like for example sting sting was a good example um sting sounded actually really good on these speakers katie malua that, that that acoustical music type of thing. Um, so I think I haven't been following Apos for many, many years for like, oh, I can't remember how many years now, but I've still listened to quite a bit of, of Apos speakers. And just generally, I would say that it's, it's a very British type of sound. And it, it's a good sound, just generally getting more in contact with that earthy, raw, more direct type of sound. Not super evolved and all of that flashy layering and, and stuff like that, but it feels a good place to, to kind of start in the, uh, the audio space to get to know a, uh, a, a speaker brand that's, that's actually, yeah, I would say, actually worth uh, exploring. And I can't say that about a lot of brands. A lot of brands, I just would say, just steer away from that brand, uh, uh, just period, you know. But I would say that Apos just gave me a bit more of that earthy, traditional, intimate sound that I lacked a lot back then when I looked through the, the used market. So, yeah, I want to commend them for, for, for that. Um... Yeah, that there's there's just the thing about um, true bass, true slam, true grunt, that low hats. It just wasn't there, you know. You could just turn up and up and up, and it just wouldn't release the sound. It it's a very typical book standing speaker type of thing, and even more with this type of speaker because. I was warned when I bought them not to turn up the sound too much because you could also slowly hear them uh, clipping when you would turn up the music. Uh, there wasn't really a, a protective mechanism uh, like with most speakers that would prevent the, I think, the treble from overloading. So I could hear that. I could definitely hear that once I turned up the sound and it was in a biggish room and I had a an amplifier that wasn't the most powerful one. I could definitely hear that it was struggling to grip the speaker and you know take it up to a, a really high level of sound. But I still think that considering the fact if you just have the speaker in like a 10 to 20 square meter room most of the time the sound levels would be okay um you just i mean with a lot of modern speakers you just have the ability to play at a volume that is much higher in a way where it's more stable where you have more grip so that was kind of the weaknesses one of the weaknesses of the speaker um 
so yeah, I, I wish that it had more of a base that was more cemented, but yeah, that's just one of the trade-offs that you get with this speaker. Um, again, it was it was it was reasonably reactive, you know. Yeah, again, uh, you can't take that for granted. A lot of the cheaper bookstanding speakers, especially from around the the nineties over to two thousand and some. Um, years in, in the early years there was a lot of molds in those speakers uh, a lot of uncertainty and i felt that at least with this even though it wasn't technically as impressive as a lot of those newer speakers back then i could still feel that with this speaker there was a bit of class a bit of authenticness you know a bit of you know direct touch to the artist and and i really like that i really like that i think i feel that we mustn't really get away from that. Uh, that's so easy to take for granted. Uh, I know with just being a lot of places that so many people, especially men, they prioritize uh, structure instead of signature. Signature uh, should be the most important thing, at least in my opinion. I know that you might have a different uh, opinion, and I fully respect that, but um, that's just my opinion uh, on the matter. And, and I feel that a lot of people would get closer to, to the goal of their sound that they wanted if they just would prioritize signature ahead of um, structure. Because nowadays you can buy a lot of speakers that does a lot of good structure here and there. It's a lot of good isolated clean detail you can get from speakers nowadays. Where back then um, it was a huge compromise. When, when you got structure you usually also got a lot of this clingy hi-fi moldish type of sound with it. So I feel that just nowadays we're, we're just so much lucky with the new speakers that we can pick out. Um, so yeah, a, a lot of a lot of tech has evolved, especially around book standing speakers. So um, yeah, I also remember trying Silversonic Revelation RCA cables on this thing. Um, especially with my Audio Labs eight thousand amp on it that was interesting i got a bit more detail but it was a more of a grainy fatiguing revealing detail so uh but it was interesting you know i felt that at least with gear like this i could hear stuff like cables you know um i could hear a uh, rega apollo cd player being connected to it um, with the silver cable i could hear both the cable the speaker the cd player each of their sounds and you might think that i'm a bit crazy for saying this but that's a bit rare when you're dealing with cheap gear there uh, like i've said in some of my other videos there is a lot of numbness a lot of obscurity where it's difficult to find your way through the detail to figure out, okay, I just bought a two, three hundred dollar RCA cable, a power cable, and I want to hear the difference. And many times you just can't hear the difference because the gear is so bad, it's so numb, it's so fake warm that a lot of stuff that you do just doesn't react. And and, and I liked it that back then already back then um i can't remember what year this is between 2006 and 2009 that i had these back then i could already back then hear the difference between a, a normal rca cable and this silver sonic revelation the um the yamaha cd player and the uh, rega apollo cd player that i used back then. I, I could hear the differences Okay, they weren't they weren't gigantic compared to nowadays when I have better gear, but at least I could hear it. At, at least it just gave me a sense of like, like oh, you know, like oh, okay, I'm glad I bought that. 
I'm glad I, I got this now. Ooh, I, now I have a bit more of a warm CD player. You know, the Rega CD player. You know, that, that was a good match. This thing with the Audio Labs 8000 and the Rega Apollo CD player, that was a, a, a great combination uh, listening to a, a low to medium level in a small room. Fine, you know, good start on, on hi-fi. Uh, starting to explore some new music types and yeah just um, just really interesting you know uh, but it was a bit limited you know it, it had its faults it felt a bit homemade the the whole speaker but for the price I can't really complain you know I can't really complain at all um they were ugly and the fact that they were painted over just made them even more ugly this this is a lot more pretty than the one i had um the one i had i think it was the front part here it's got painted with this uglier fake black do-it-yourself um uh color um it really looked like some i don't know a nazi boot or something like that it just it looked horrible you know um one of those type of things that you could never get a wife to approve of even if it was for free <laughs> so um yeah the wife acceptance factor uh not very big with this speaker <laughs> but you know since then they've made them in some more attractive colors and i think that i just me guessing i would guess that the filtering is a lot better nowadays the cabinets is better the units are better that's just me guessing, but I think a lot has happened in those circa 30 years since they came out with these. So, yeah, um, those are my considerations. I hope you guys liked it. Have a nice day.